Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining today. My name is Perry Carell. I'm director of wireless solutions at Extreme Networks. Uh, part of my responsibility is also interfacing with the Wi-Fi Alliance, the IEEE, and the, uh, the WBA, the Wireless Broadband Alliance. And today we're going to talk about the future of Wi-Fi. And it's not just going to be me. We're also going to have Zias joining us today. So Zias, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks, Perry. I appreciate the introduction. I'm Zias Caraval, a principal analyst with ZK Research. I run my own research firm. I've been doing that about oh, 10 years. Before that, actually, I was the chief research officer of Yankee Group. And before that, Perry, I, uh, I don't have a typical analyst background. I was actually a CIO and a network engineer. So I've been playing with Wi-Fi technology ever since there was Wi-Fi. And it's been interesting to see uh, the evolution of it to get to the point where we are today, where it's really mission critical. Well, that's great because actually, if you think about it, the fact that you've had that background, you're not just looking at what's happening. You also had to live and breathe that stuff back in the day. So it's going to actually lend a, a little bit of of credibility going forward with the, with the next slide, which, you know, talk a little bit about the, the digital transformation and what's happening out there. Yeah, digital transformation is kind of a funny thing. In fact, the, uh, the COVID pan pandemic, you know, that uh, uh, that's going on has actually accelerated it. Um, uh, I've seen companies really move forward with what they're doing digital technologies. Now, when we think of digital transformation, we think of things like cloud mobility, IoT, things like that. And they may seem somewhat unrelated, but the one commonality all those things tend to have is they're all network centric in nature. So the more digital companies become, the more network centric they become. And Wi Fi is a big part of that. In fact, if you look at some of the data points of this chart, 80 billion connected devices by 2025, certainly IoT is on the rise. Uh, you know, we have 4K video, 80% um, uh, of interactions uh, in, in contact centers be completed by AI, the clouds, you know, off the charts. And so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's my thesis that the, the network, particularly the Wi-Fi network, has now become a foundational component of digital transformation. In fact, I've worked with a lot of companies, and by and large, when the digital initiatives fail, it was because wireless wasn't really ready. I've talked to retailers that have tried to put tablet programs in place, schools that have tried to go to online learning, things like that. And, and in, in general, when the Wi-Fi is not ready uh, or the IT staff wasn't really warned in, in advance and they couldn't do the proper upgrades, those, those uh, initiatives fail. So I'm sure, Perry, you've seen that through a lot of your customers as well. I know you and I have talked about this ad nauseum. No, no, absolutely. And that's, the, you know, one of the things you hit on that I think is really, really important. And you kind of mentioned, you know, what's changed recently with the, the whole COVID thing and all that. If you look at, I, I hate to put it this way, but how actually advanced Wi-Fi, because if you think about it, you know, three, four, five months ago, depending on what business you are, you closed up your laptop in your office on a Friday afternoon and Monday you open that laptop in your dining room table. And we couldn't have done that without Wi-Fi. Mind you, everybody's Wi-Fi might be a little bit different, whatever, but Wi-Fi is what's enabled you to work from home to uh, distance learning, to telemedicine, to all that stuff. And that's to your point, as far as the numbers growth, that's only gonna explode those numbers going forward. One of the other things I see driving this is the fact that, you know, maybe you don't always see it, but Wi-Fi, the chipsets and that stuff is actually getting cheaper. And it allows me to put that stuff into your, your IoT technology, put it in pro pretty much anything. It might not be the latest technology, but I'm allowing it to do it. And that's where we're going to hit these ridiculous numbers of 15, 50, whatever billion number you want to put in there. And it, it's what's driving this industry because nobody's connecting in anymore. I mean, we, we've got offices. We're building new office spaces now. We're not running Cat 5, Cat 6, Cat 7 cable. People are building houses now that they're not running, even even the um, the phone lines, because they're assuming everything is yeah. going to be wireless. And so it is driving this. Yeah, actually, it's a it's a strange thing, too, when you buy even a consumer device and there's no Wi-Fi interface on it, right? Wi-Fi chip in it, you, you almost look at it like it's some archaic technology. So, you know, you think of even at home, garage door openers, your refrigerator, the Alexa type devices, everything's Wi-Fi connected today. In fact, I, uh, I recently toured uh, one of the newer stadiums. And, uh, you know, Wi-Fi is a big part of fan experience today. And so it's, uh, it, you know, it's it, Wi-Fi. We, we used to think, Perry, when I was an engineer, and I know you've been doing this for a long time, Wi-Fi used to be thought as the network of convenience, right? And then anything important you did over wired. But that's gone away. Today, Wi-Fi is the network of convenience and it's the mission critical network. And so this delineation we had of do it over wired if it's important, do it over wireless for mobility goes away. Wi-Fi is really the primary and first network today. 
No, absolutely, and I, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, the uh, the NFL type stuff because obviously Extreme's been a, a primary um, uh, a, a proponent of that, and actually we're the official Wi-Fi vendor of the NFL, and it, it's unbelievable that people go to the games to watch. You figure they're going to sit there for three hours and watch the game, but the amount of data they generate is, is unbelievable, which kind of brings us to, you know, we're talking about Wi-Fi and the different technologies that, you know, where did we get to today? And it's, it's kind of fun to take a look back at the Wi-Fi evolution. And one of the things I always point about the Wi-Fi evolution is that us as vendors, we've caused ourselves enormous amount of problems. And reason for that is about every 12, 18, 24 months, we come running out to the customers. We come running out to the consultants. We come running out to the partners and go, have we got a deal for you? This brand new technology is going to solve all your problems and give you unlimited performance and quality. And we did that for 11 A, B, G, N, 150, N, 300, AC Wave 1, AC Wave 2. And now we're getting a Wi-Fi 6 or 11 AX technology. It's important to understand the IEEE wrote the 11 AX standard, the Wi-Fi Alliance. They certify devices and that's called Wi-Fi 6. So that's the confusion between the two. Yeah. But Wi-Fi 6 is really, really different. And people need to understand that and appreciate that. Do you, do you agree? I, I do. It is uh, significantly different. In fact, uh, it's the first Wi-Fi technology that, is, that was built with the assumption that we work in an all-wireless workplace, right? So I think all previous versions of Wi-Fi before 6 assumed that Wi-Fi augmented what you did with wired I think when they built Wi-Fi 6, and it's fundamentally different, and I've talked to people in the standards body about this, it's really um, uh, uh, built with that, that preconceived notion that we that we would be Wi-Fi first. And the other thing it did is it crossed that wired barrier, right? If you look at some of the speeds uh, that you had on the chart before, uh, barrier 2 meg, 11 meg, 54 meg, 300 meg, the wired technology always outpaced Wi-Fi. But today, there's been a crossover point, right? Wi-Fi is now... Uh, faster, it's past that gig mark. We're not running 10 gig wired to the desktop. And so we actually, in theory, can get better bandwidth speeds that are Wi-Fi than we can on a wired. So that's that's a profound change in in, uh, in the way we think about Wi-Fi. That, that's pretty interesting you say that because, once again, I hate to say our ages and stuff, but we kind of went, we were involved with the evolution of Wi-Fi. And as you said, a decade ago, it was like, okay, you know, I plug in, that gives me my performance, reliability and stuff. And if I need mobility, I'll have the Wi-Fi too. Now Wi-Fi is the standard for the applications for reliability, for capability, for all that stuff. And I only deploy wired if I have to. And that's an important thing to understand going forward because... One of the things to understand and appreciate is, is why we're saying this, why Wi-Fi 6 is different. As I said, every every iteration, us as vendors said, this is a great, this is the greatest thing that happened. But with Wi-Fi 6, with 11AX, we, we got, and I don't want to call it Wi-Fi switching because your, your techies freak out about that. But now I have the ability to actually talk to more than one user at a time. What most people don't realize is that when I've been buying APs for the last, 15 years, everybody's concerned about associations. How many people can I associate to this AP? 50, 100, 200, whatever ridiculous number you want. What people don't realize is up until the 11AX Wi-Fi 6, only one device can talk. So even though I might have 50 or 200 users associated to that radio, I'm only talking to one at a time and there's a priority scheme and all that stuff. What Wi-Fi 6 did, and primarily with what's called the OFDMA, Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiple Access. If you say that, you sound very, very smart. What that allows yeah. me to do now is talk to multiple people at one time. So it's not just a prioritization scheme. Thoughts? Yeah, actually, I um, I think everybody who's probably on this, uh, watching this session has been in a situation where you're in a keynote, you're in a lecture hall, you're tweeting away, you're typing away, you're browsing away, and all of a sudden, everything stops working, right? And you don't know why that is. Sometimes you get kicked off, sometimes you don't. But it looks like you're connected, looks like you've got signal strength, you haven't moved, but yet stuff's not working. And that's because of that problem you talked about where uh, you do, it is too congested and it can only talk to one at a time. The analogy I've used, it's a little bit like if you're in that grocery store line and you're behind that elderly person, you know, someone that looks like you, uh, that's writing the check or counting the change, right? That, that cashier cannot start with your transaction until that person's finished writing that check. Well, what if there was a way while the person's writing the check, right, that the cashier could start with your order and then pause you and then start with the next order? That's what OFDMA brings is the ability to almost take all those little gaps in time that you have where the Wi-Fi is not being used 
and service the next person. So a lot of the things you have on here, Perry, and I, I know you're very well aware of this, so we're, we're taken out of the world of cellular where they had to deal with these problems long ago, right? So we brought some of those best practices in, brought them into Wi-Fi. And so this is why I say it's a fundamentally different type of Wi-Fi. Every version of Wi-Fi up to now has been based on the concept that's just a faster version you know, Wi-Fi 5 was a faster version of 4, a faster version of 3, but architecturally it was the same. Wi-Fi 6 is the first one where we've actually taken a step back and said, let's fix all those problems with Wi-Fi to actually make it, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, act a lot more like a wired switch. And I know the technical people don't like that, but that's that's essentially what it is. You know, um, we didn't script this ahead of time like that, but I could actually kind of pay you for what you just said because that's that's the important thing to understand as far is what's changed and how advantage it is and being able to do this that you don't have to prioritize one device well you're still going to have prioritization but to be able to talk yeah. to multiple people at one time but the other key point and it's very very important because a lot of times you know we talk about 11ax we talk about wi-fi 6 and then you got some customers out there which they're allowed to do that they're going you know I'm not going to be the bleeding edge. I'm not going to be the guy who jumps in this technology first and has it fails. What's important and what ZS just said is none of this is new. You look at OFDMM, you look at longer um, symbols, you look at multi-user MIMO, you look at TWT, you look at the OBSS, all these techie terms of what form the components of Wi-Fi 6, none of them are new. OFDMA, oh my God, it's so new, it's so important. 2007 WiMAX, that's where it first came. And as I said, it came out of the yeah. cellular side. So the A11AX task group, what they did is they took workable off the shelf technology. Yeah, they tweaked it and all that stuff, but they brought it together to actually advance, improve the Wi-Fi service. And it got us to the point now that, you know, if I have uh, voice traffic, if I have nurse call systems, they don't have to wait anymore because they only need a little bit of bandwidth, but it needed consistent. So it gives you a much, much better. So the nice thing about Wi-Fi 6 is that it's at the end, right? That's that's it. That's all we're going to do. Wi-Fi 6, we're done that's with Wi-Fi forever. That's all. That's, yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, no, there Absolutely are new things coming, not. right? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, no, there are new things coming. In fact, uh, Wi-Fi 7 is already on the horizon. Wi-Fi 6 e is coming. Uh, that's 6 gigahertz version of 1. In fact, uh, for, you, for people watching this, if you want to go into a really nitty gritty depth on how the difference between Wi-Fi 6 and 6E, and I get the sense that a lot of people really don't understand there's a difference between 6E and 6. They think it's like wave one, wave two with AC. But Perry and I actually did a Q&A together. It's on Network World. Just if you Google my name or Perry's name or Wi-Fi 6E, uh, you'll probably find it. But uh, it does, uh, 6E is interesting in that uh, it's the first time we're using 6 gigahertz, right, for, for part of Wi-Fi. Uh, it, it creates uh, some new spectrum for us, so uh, we don't get the congestion with all the other older devices that we have. Uh, you know, 2.4 goes away, so you don't have to worry about those type of devices. But it gives us some fresh spectrum to use to actually power a whole new class of devices, right? So, Perry, you and I have talked about it, so, I, you know, what, what are your simple thoughts on 6E? Fresh spectrum. That's kind of one way to say it. We bait, you know, yeah. with, with 6E, with the 6 gigahertz space, they say we double the amount of spectrum. I say we quadruple the amount of usable spectrum because in the existing 5 gigahertz, yeah, you can have up to 25 available channels, but a lot of those you're competing with other technologies and you have to use what's called DFS so you don't interfere, especially with Doppler radar and stuff. With yeah. six gigahertz i'm actually getting about four times the amount of usable bandwidth and that's really cool the the analogy i like to use is let's say you're on a freeway around any major city in the united states and it's seven o'clock in the morning and the speed limit sign says 65 and you're doing 16 because there's so much traffic there's so much contention you got a john deere tractor in front of you you had scooters and you look off to your left and there's this brand new highway being built and it's probably 20 lanes wide and the only people allowed on it are Formula One race cars. Because that's the thing about six gigahertz or six E is that in order to support that, it's only gonna be Wi-Fi six or above. So you're not, as Zias just said, you're not gonna have the older devices competing. So everybody's gotta be high performance, a lot cleaner spectrum and a lot more spectrum. So I don't know what more you can ask about that. It's gonna give you the best of all worlds, uh, you know, higher level of security, lots of channels. So VR and AR is actually gonna be able to take hold. Yeah, and I've heard people are concerned because uh, a few people I've talked to are concerned about it because it won't support older devices and things. We have Wi-Fi 6 for that, right? Eventually, we're going to get to the point where we do go through a device re refresh. The device manufacturers tend to be fairly aggressive on new radios and stuff. They want to have good performance themselves. And so I do think that uh, you will see device manufacturers, tablets, laptops, things like that, pick up 6E. 
uh, in a way to be able to get themselves the best possible experience as well. Exactly. And one final thought you kind of mentioned that 6E, the radio itself is not backwards compatible because it only supports 6 gigahertz, but the access points you buy will be. They'll support 2.4 and they'll support 5 gigahertz. So that being said, we, we, we had a lot of discussion about um, Wi-Fi, but do we even need to bother because isn't 5G going to eliminate the need for any Wi-Fi and it's all going to go away and those 15 billion devices you're going to have to replace? Yeah, I hear about this a lot from the 5G providers, obviously, is that Get rid of your Wi-Fi. You can go all 5G, and I don't. I, to be honest, I don't really understand how this would work. And I don't know too many companies that are going to put a SIM card in every IoT device. I don't know how that would work contractually. Don't get me wrong. I think 5G is going to change the world, uh, but I think it's more of a WAN technology, and it complements what we're doing with Wi-Fi very nicely. In that, I can bring network access now into more places and more times. Think like first responder truck. I could put a high speed bandwidth in, you know, with a 5G chip in, in that, but then I could hang a Wi Fi access point off it to give Wi Fi wireless access to a lot of people, right? So I, I do think 5G is game changing uh, by its very nature and that it, it allows us for, you know, as you see here, massive IoT and uh, enhanceable broadband and things, but it's a complement to Wi Fi, not a replacement. One of the big things, and you and I actually talked talk about this uh, uh, at length, that's come up too, is the data. Right? If I'm using 5G and buying service from a service provider, they own the data. If I want to do my own analytics to understand what's going on, you mentioned the NFL. I've talked to the NFL about what they want to do with Wi-Fi. They provide it so they can understand what social channels people use, how they should market, uh, you know, things like that. If all of a sudden I'm using 5G for that, now I got to go buy my own data back from the 5G provider. And that's kind of a weird thing. So, um, you know, if you if you've watched this and you've read in the public media about how 5G is going to kill Wi-Fi. Don't believe it. It's a compliment. Be familiar with how it works and understand where to use it, but it doesn't, one does not replace the other, just like Wi-Fi 6 isn't going to replace uh, uh, 5G itself, right? Absolutely. That's so important for people to understand that yeah. and appreciate that. The only people out there that are saying that 5G is going to displace Wi-Fi in any way, shape, or form are specific. I'm not going to pick on anybody. Let's just call them carriers in general. That it, 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 They see that as, a, you know, I don't even want to call it money or whatever, but they believe. But if you look at things like even the Wi-Fi Alliance, they see collaboration between them. The Wireless Broadband Alliance, collaboration between them. Everybody's collaborating. You know, you have these articles where you make it like um, like it's an MMA, MMA competition, that 5G versus Wi-Fi. It doesn't exist. It's more like the analogy I use is WWE. It's like tag team wrestling. They're both going to do. They both have values. And that's the important part going forward. And, and as far as devices, as you said, but some people right now, their phones will support 5G. Your next phone probably will, and definitely you're following after that, probably will support some level of 5G, even though it's all over the map. But how many tablets out there support a 5G interface, a cellular interface? How many um, laptops? How many wireless printers at home or in your office support a wireless? And you know what about your smart TV? It's not going to happen. You've got approximately 14 billion Wi-Fi devices out there. You're eventually going to have, you know, about a, by 2025, you're supposed to have one and a half billion 5G type devices out there. It's not going to displace it. They're all going to work together. 5G, Wi-Fi, CBRS, uh, ultra wideband, Zigbee, Z-Wave, BLE, they, they all have special use cases. They have areas where they work better than any other technology. There's also areas where any one of those technologies can support. And then there's, there is such a thing as good enough. I know people don't want to say that, but you know, if I deploy 5G anywhere, I'm also going to have Wi-Fi. It, it just you just can't yeah. displace it. It just can't go away. And as uh, as Zeus was mentioned before, right now the biggest thing, and we're going to talk about this in a slide or two, is everybody's talking about ML, AI, analytics, and stuff. And now if I have a femto cell or a micro cell in my office or in my house or whenever it's going to be, I'm going to connect to that, and that's going to forward all my traffic back to the central office. I just lost visibility into my analytics. As I, I emphasize that, my analytics. What's and then obviously there's going to be some type of packages out there to deal with it, but I don't know what they're going to be. Yes. Yeah. No. I, I I brought that up before. You 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 can't be in a situation when you're buying your own data back, right? That's um, that's crazy. <laughs> and also that the pricing model doesn't work. If if you if they really tried to build five G radios into every TV, garage door opener, refrigerator, how many subscriptions would you need? Even if they're only charging you. A few bucks a month those few bucks a month over i don't know going to your 
uh, extreme dashboard for the Wi-Fi at home, you probably have 50, 60 Wi-Fi connected devices, right? So even at a couple of bucks per month for each of those, now all of a sudden your bills go way up, right? So practically speaking, unless the, unless the, the, the pricing model and the way the 5G services delivery is completely changed, it just isn't practical. No, I agree. And I think once you get Wi-Fi at your home, I don't care how many devices you hook on, it's still free. Yeah. <laughs> it's a still. So the next thing is we, we talked about Wi-Fi. We talk about how exploding, what it's going up and managing Wi-Fi. You, you have some thoughts about trying to manage Wi-Fi. Yeah, I did a Wi-Fi uh, a troubleshooting survey uh, last year. And I did this because uh, with Wi-Fi 6 coming and with digital transformation happening, I did say that... Um, Wi-Fi is a foundational component of digital transformation. Well, the way we manage Wi-Fi must change. I think Wi-Fi troubleshooting is perhaps the most difficult thing there is to do in IT, partially because somebody, you know, somebody calls a user, a help desk up and says the signal isn't working. By the time you even start the troubleshooting process, the problem is gone, right? So uh, you can see this data point here, just under 60% of respondents in my survey said that they dedicate at least a quarter of their work time uh, to troubleshooting Wi-Fi issues. There is not one network engineer that I know that became a network professional so they could troubleshoot Wi-Fi. It's very, very difficult to do. The other problem is that we don't really have very good tools for this either. 59% of the respondents to my survey said they actually, they rely heavily on packet capture for Wi-Fi troubleshooting more than a quarter of the time. And if you're using packet capture, I don't wanna pick on packet capture tools, but it is the troubleshooting tool of last resort. And, and by the time you set it up and you wind up capturing packets, the problem could be gone, right? So I think, Fundamentally, if we're going to make Wi-Fi the foundation of our digital enterprise, we need to change the way we manage. And there's so much data being generated today that people cannot correlate the data fast enough. We have to rely on artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so when I've talked to network engineers about this in the past, they look at AI, you know, they, they uh, use a technical term, they get the heebie-jeebies, right? Because it's going to take their job away. But make no mistake, AI and ML is the network engineer's best friend. So. I know you guys have worked a lot on this. What do you see coming here? No, that, that's, that's a good point to have because it, it kind of goes in a couple different ways. Obviously, you mentioned cloud. Obviously, you mentioned the amount of data and this stuff. But one of the issues, and you already mentioned that with Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi problems are typically dynamic. Yeah, if the AP fails, it's pretty much to figure that out. But a lot of the times, as you said, you know, I had a problem with my network. What had I? It was kind of slow. I don't know. It's kind of working better now, but whatever. And so what's the first thing that your tech support says to do? Well, can you get me a packet capture? Well, if I do it now, um, everything's working fine. It's not going to help me. And, and that's what yeah. AI and um, machine learning and, and deep uh, learning and all this stuff is all about. The way I look at it, it's, it's all about gathering enormous amounts of data. Human beings can do this. I could hire 50 people to sit there with Excel spreadsheets and monitor data all day long. But the neat thing about AI, the neat thing, especially in machine learning is that I can gather enormous amounts of data. In our cloud right now, we offer the option of unlimited data. You don't look back just 30 days or 60 days or 90 days or whatever, unlimited. As long as you've been on the cloud, we'll be able to look back at that data. And why that's important is if you have a short-term event, and Wi-Fi, a lot of them is, you could actually identify that device, go back and figure out what happened. Let me see the hour before it, the hour after it, the 10 minutes before it, the 10 minutes, and tell me what happened at that point. And that actually allows me to do some much, much better analysis. And plus I can, I can, I can do the mundane stuff. I can watch for things that are happening on the network and actually make decisions about that. You know, we talk a lot about Wi-Fi because we're kind of brainiacs on there. It's like, you know, DFS is one of the things I was talking about. DFS, make sure I don't see any, um, I'm not interfering with Doppler radar. But, you know, if I've got an AI system or if I've got a machine learning system that says, you know, we've been monitoring your network for the last six months. We've never seen a, uh, you know, a, um, Doppler radar signature. You probably don't have to turn off all those DFS channels. You could probably actually use it. That's the advantage of AI and machine learning and all that stuff that I can see all this stuff and they make recommendations to you. What do you think? Yeah, I actually think it dovetails nicely too into cloud managed. I know uh, Extreme and uh, companies like you've been working a lot on, on uh, shifting a lot of the management to the cloud. Uh, when I think about the compute cycles that are required for AI, it's hard to do that on with on-prem systems. Also, the other benefit that you get uh, with cloud-based management is you can act, uh, I know Extreme's working on this too, is being able to do cross-company correlation of data, right, or, or just the metadata, so you can now make recommendations on how to change things. And so, the, the you know, what Wi-Fi, what AI does, it lets you spot anomalies that are so small that the 
uh, that the human eye can't uh, just can't can't see that. And I'll give you a, a you know a good analogy. I was talking with some of the folks at uh, Mass General Hospital here in the New England area, and uh, when they started first started using AI to diagnose MRIs, a lot of the doctors didn't really like it because they thought that's what I'm supposed to be doing. But AI can spot like little brain brain bleeds, uh, brain bleeds, anomalies, things like that that you just couldn't spot even with a microscope. And so now doctors are spending more time treating patients and less time diagnosing issues. Same thing with wireless uh, technologies. As I mentioned, it's one of the hardest things to do. As a network engineer, I'm sure you'd rather spend more time fixing the problem and redesigning your network and doing the strategic things versus looking through packet capture. So if you're tired of looking through reams and reams and reams of data and trying to correlate it manually, look to a lot of the artificial intelligence system. Because to me, it's the biggest game changer we've had in networking uh, maybe ever. Let me give you another example that kind of, you know, dovetails really, really well into what you just said about the MRI review. Imagine I'm managing hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of devices, AP switches, whatever. And on this one AP, maybe out in the middle of a tumble, Iowa, wherever, I noticed over the last six months that the internal temperature has incremented up slightly, one or two degrees. That's got nothing to do with traffic or CPU usage or whatever. But I can't detect that as a person. There's no way I'm going to do that. But if I detect that with machine learning and maybe based on your or based on history, I know that that's a signature of maybe a chip going bad or something. I can actually resolve that before I have a problem. And I can, that's the only way you can detect this type of stuff. And it's very, very important to understand that and very, very important to appreciate that. So essentially, you know, what we're talking here is the ability to actually get smarter. You know, we're talking about, you know, making yeah. your next Wi-Fi decision and what technology do I want? Do I do I want to manage via, via the cloud? Do I want to leverage AI? They all go hand in hand. It, it's tied together. And, you know, I appreciate your thoughts to kind of wrap this up for us today, Zias. Yeah, I, as I mentioned before, I think we're moving into an era that's largely uh, digitized, right? So the wireless network that you have becomes a foundational component. In fact, if you look at most of the digital technologies out there, as I mentioned, they're network centric in nature. So you do need a different kind of Wi-Fi. And along with that, you do need to think about how to manage your network differently. And I think what AI does and the influx of AI and, and, and cloud is it takes your, your, your good engineer, it makes them a super engineer, right? Because it gives them insights that they just couldn't have had before. And so, uh, you know, as we, the title of this was uh, the, the evolution of Wi-Fi and why your next upgrade is so important. Uh, it, it could be one of the most important things, uh, in, you know, for, for your company, uh, really in the next uh, 24, 36 months. The next Wi-Fi upgrade is going to be the thing that powers your digital company uh, for the next few years. Absolutely. And, and as you said, and we said, AI is not replacing anything. It's another tool. It's a very, very valuable tool. So once again, thank you, Zeus, yeah. for joining us. Thank everybody for joining today. Uh, everybody have a great day.